Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the programming committee for organizing or continuing to organize this annual uh, Women in Finance. This is our uh, networking. This is our sixth year. We started in 2018, so this is our sixth year, and we continue to do it, and we have a wonderful audience. So thank you to everyone for coming for this. Um, all right, I would like to introduce our uh, DNI committee members, uh, and we have a uh, wonderful committee. Juan Mendez is our uh, committee chair. He's not here today. He's with BlackRock. Um, we have Kathy Christman uh, here, and we have uh, Kirsten Travers. She is our latest, our newest DNI committee member. So um, thank you to these wonderful ladies and Joe Beatty, who's not here today uh, for his efforts. Um, the reason um, I'm standing here today is because the DNI committee needs your support. Um, I don't know if any of you remember, but we had achieved our goal of having 20% uh, diverse members, or women members, in the year 2020. Does anyone remember that? Yes. Yay. Yes. But now, we have um, fallen a little behind. We have slipped back down to a little under 18%. Um, members, diverse members in um, in the society. We are about 292 women out of 1,650 members. So, um, so we would love to get back to 20% or even 25% because we did, believe it or not, pre-pandemic have this lofty goal of getting to 25% diverse members by year 2025, and then of course pandemic hit and all the reasons for us to kind of fall back. Um, so just very quickly, I would like to give some of the uh, positive or some of the initiatives that we're working on. Um, on our board, we 28% of our board members are women, so that's, um, I would just clap that. That's wonderful. Um, we are continuing to work uh, in building the pipeline in schools and, we're, uh, and universities. We do annual road shows. We've gone to UGA, Georgia Tech, um, Emory, we do that every year, but we are trying to expand that. Um, we also have DNI scholarships. Uh, if you all know students or folks that are interested in applying for the scholarships to study for the CFA exam, please reach out to any of us. Um, we also like to work with the women initiatives and in different uh, corporations like the uh, Invesco's Women's Network, Truest Women's Network, so we partner with them. Uh, even local organizations like Women's, Women in Alternative Investing, Women in Pension Network, Women in ETFs. So we have various outreach efforts that we would like for everyone to partner with us and so that we can spread the word. Um, you know, we would also like to highlight how important it is for everyone's organizations to have a path back for, to the office for mid-career women um, who take time off for the family. And we really, really need to work on that to move forward so that we can see more women in the C-suite. Um, so if you would like to support our ideas, our outreach, help us get to that 20, 25% mark, Please reach out to any of us. We are, um, this is just an active call to looking for volunteers. Um, so thank you. Thanks so much, Ravna. Um, look, we're, we're thrilled today um, to be joined by this esteemed panel. Thanks so much for all your efforts and time to get, uh, to get here tonight. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to moderator, Chris Wilson. He's uh, the head of Global Client Portfolio Management at Boy Investment Management, and with that, I think the wire is not working, so we can pass that back. Oh. I'm, wow, okay, all right. Are we there? How about now? Is that okay? Yeah. 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 Awesome. So we have an incredible panel, but let's kick it off with introduction. Well, I know there's networking uh, before uh, we're gonna go, starting furthest with uh, Laura Ram, do you want to introduce yourself and maybe speak a little bit about your career path? Sure. Hi. Thank you so much for, for having me tonight. I'm so excited for this evening. Um, my name is Laura Rehm, and uh, by day, I am uh, the chief U.S. economist at FS Investments. My home is in Philadelphia, um, and I've been there for eight years now. 
And I've uh, started my career on Wall Street in 1993 at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So most of my life has um, been doing economics with an eye on uh, the markets. And um, I love, uh, you know, what I really enjoy about my job are sort of the, the two-sided piece of it. I get to hang, you know, sort of nerd out and write research reports, and then I get to come out and speak and uh, do fun things like be on TV and uh, go to conferences and also uh, meet with our advisors in, in office. I'm also the proud mother of two daughters, 13 and 15, so seventh and, and, and a ninth grader. Um, I actually can't believe that, um, you know, in just a short time, I'll have one launching to college, so. <laughs> um, uh, that's a, my short introduction, and now uh, moving on to Chrissy. Um, thank you all for having me here today. So I'm Christy Luke. I work with WTW, formerly known as Willis Towers Watson, formerly known as Towers Watson, and so forth and so forth. <laughs> um, but yes, we are now called WTW, and we are still purple. Um, so, I serve as a portfolio manager for a discretionary business, so ultimately I would think about that in the sense of for any client that is using our OCIO capabilities, our team in the U.S. is really responsible for those outcomes. So think about strategy, asset allocation, and ultimately implementation, and we typically use a multi-manager, kind of manager of managers approach for our implementation. So we are global in nature, so even though I manage our U.S. Uh, OCIO portfolios. We are connected through a global investment committee as well as a U.S. investment committee. So I sit on those groups and then also am responsible for managing our global equity solution and support our real assets building block solution. Um, when I joined WTW, I actually started as a consultant. So was serving in a senior consultant for quite a while, probably about eight or nine years here in the southeast region before moving to the OCIO side. And prior to that, I actually started my career on the asset management side. So it was up in the Midwest, in both Milwaukee and Chicago, for about 10 years prior to joining WTW. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Hood. I am based here in Atlanta, and I work for Callen. Um, so I'm still an investment consultant. I had a more meandering path and got here and have stayed here. Uh, so I work with Talent, I work for um, a variety of clients. I work with endowments, foundations, hospitals, pension plans, 401k plans, both corporate and public, so a little bit of everything. Uh, in addition to that, I do manage our Atlanta office as well, so I'm responsible for a team here and overseeing our work in the Southeast. Um, I serve on our management committee, search committee, there's a whole bunch of internal committees, so I do a lot of things. Um, and before that, I was a consultant at Elwood. Before that, was also on the investment management side. I overlapped for a few months. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we were both at William Blair for a yeah. hot second. Yeah. Christy came to Atlanta first. <laughs> <laughs> so we were both in Chicago at William Blair. She came here. I went to San Francisco, then came back here. Uh, so a little bit of a, a different path. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Tosh. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer of TCW, uh, which is an asset management firm based on the West Coast in LA. Uh, we have offices around the world, and we manage about $200 billion in private credit, public credit, um, and, uh, and public equities. So I'm also very excited to be here with these incredible panelists, and excited to be in Atlanta um, as well. I had a uh, dinner last night with my best friend since I was born, which was really fun. Um, and I have a new friend here, Shayla, up front. We're on the board of Notre Dame together. Thank you for coming to support me. Um, so great to be in Atlanta, great to be on this panel. From a career perspective, just very briefly, um, I worked at uh, Goldman Sachs for 20 years from a summer analyst through to a partner um, up until a year ago when I joined TCW. It was a great experience, and in that, company and in the asset management business, I was there the whole time. Um, we run many different asset classes, many different businesses, so I really had a portfolio career there um, where I worked across a number of different businesses and had the privilege of leading our multi-asset business. And then my last role was as the CIO of our uh, public equities franchise, which I did before I came to TCW. And just to finish the career point, the motivator for doing that, and Elizabeth and I talked a little bit about this before the panel, was I was really eager to move to do asset management in a company that's in a private setting with the specific shareholder base we have where employees are the largest shareholders. And I'm really, I love my time at Goldman, but I'm really happy I made the move. 
And thank you to my PCW colleagues who are here. Awesome. You know, I'm oh, gonna, sorry, I, I, I think I can actually <laughs> I gave away lean in. <laughs> So we're going to structure the conversation around a handful of themes, touch on some market calls, uh, and then accommodate time for, uh, for Q&A as, uh, as well. Uh, so obviously, uh, happy Women's Day to everybody uh, attending, including the men. <laughs> we can all celebrate together. Uh, so look, what continues to be a bit of a challenge, uh, financial services is not known as the most welcoming for diversity. It's an area that we are all continuing to, to struggle and, and address. And so a couple of, and we want to address this in two ways. So from a firm perspective, mm -hmm. uh, what are your respective firms doing as it relates to diversity and recruiting, mm -hmm. uh, and for that matter, retaining? But then we'll also go in the middle with our consultants who might be able to speak to some observations, no name to name names, uh, but maybe what you've seen uh, from, asset, from the asset management industry as well as in addition to your firms. So maybe we could start off with Lara, and then we'll hit Katie, and then we'll go to the side. Sure. Um, so, you know, I think our firm has, um, you know, hired, I guess about two years ago now, a, a head of diversity and inclusion who reports directly to our CEO. And that, to me, was a really important step. I, I know, um, you know the previous woman who had been doing a fantastic job um, doing some work in that had been frustrated that the role was not uh, directly uh, reporting up to the very top and I think you know that really makes a, a difference to know that that person is you know really um, in the room and is really um, aligned with the very very top of the organization um, I know sometimes org charts seem silly but I also feel like they can send strong signals so in that way uh, I think it's really really important you know I think we, we have uh, more trainings we have more discussions we've done a long four-part series um, but I think we also have spent a lot more intentional time um, on peer lunches um, and on um, you know ERG groups within our company. And I think you know to me recruitment is so important. It's building the pipeline and then it's keeping that pipeline moving forward. So um, you know that to me have been the the aspects that I've been so pleased to see over the years. It's not an area of my company that I oversee. Specifically. Specifically, um, but I think it's really moved the needle because you know it's been incredible for me to see the change versus when I started in the early 1990s. Um, I actually started the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I was the first um, incoming group where women were allowed to wear pants suits. Prior to that, we had not been women had to wear skirt suits. So um, I do feel like you know, I think about those things sometimes, and I think, yeah, we've we've come some distance. That's so nice. <laughs> Um, for, I'm going to think that go every time I wear a pantsuit. Um, that's great. So um, I, let me just say something very briefly about philosophy on diversity, and then I'll just talk, make an observation. You asked what companies are doing about it. So um, Shayla and I talked a little about this before the panel, but I want to express that my philosophy on diversity as a woman that's pretty, pretty senior in this industry for the last 20 years is to make sure we talk about it in the context of the um, case for performance. Uh, it's very, very important to me. Whenever I engage with our clients, I really come back to that. And what I mean by that is that we happen to work in an industry where there is tremendous value in the healthy tension of variant perspectives. Like put aside the social discourse on diversity, it's just true that in, in an industry we're trying or we're trying to do something very different from the market to produce differentiated returns, you really want to have healthy tension of variant perspectives. Or you can think about it the reverse, which is if we go out or I went out as a manager and I hired a bunch of people that grew up in the same communities and went to the same colleges and looked the same way and went to the same fraternities and then worked at the same companies, I probably wouldn't capture that diversity of perspective. So I really only try and engage in this discussion around the case for performance uh, for our clients because that's the business that we're in. And so if we can make a strong case around that, then I can actually bring everybody along on the journey with me, which I think is super important. And I can anchor it in something that I know everybody I'll talk, I talk to cares about, which is their own individual return or their return for their clients. Um, I do, uh, I'm proud to have a good track record on this topic. So I said the last business I ran at um, GSAM was an equities business and half of our assets were run by female portfolio managers. 
So it is true, and I think the CFA can get to the 25% aspirate. I mean, by the way, that's uh, just so we have an aspiration that was articulated um, at the outset of this of 25%, which by the way, is not the demographic split of the country. So I'm sure we can get to the, the 25%. We can be more ambitious than that. Um, and so that, that was true, that we got a team to do that, which looked different from the industry. So I'll end my comments by saying, I think one of the reasons we were able to do that is that we had a woman that was leading that business. And now when I'm at TCW, um, we are attracting a lot of female talent. And I will tell you, we don't talk about diversity. It's just not something I talk with my team a lot about. It is also true that my C-suite team is 85% female. Um, I went out and hired a lot of those people. I did not hire them because they're women. I didn't set out and say, I'm gonna hire a bunch of women. It will not surprise you to know that's not what I'm incentivized to do, is hire women. I'm incentivized to generate great results for our clients and build a great business. I just went out and found the best people I could find that were in my network, and it was also true the number of them were women. So what are some takeaways from that? It's that the network effect is very powerful, and so if we're gonna change the complexion of this industry, we have to really think through that network effect. It is also true that we're able to recruit a lot of diverse talent with very little friction. Why is that? Because the diverse talent comes to find you. And why do women want to come to organizations that are led by other women, or we can take any other underrepresented group? Because those underrepresented groups want the same thing as the majority which is that they want to do a great job for their clients, uh, build wealth for their clients, and on the back of it, they want to have their own personal wealth creation. And if they see and their own seats of influence, authority, power, risk-taking, whatever, you just want the same thing. There's that movie, and I got asked that a lot by my male partners at Goldman, like, what do women want? Whatever that, <laughs> tell them, like, is that here? <laughs> no, like, there uh, There's a lot of movies filmed here. But like, it's yeah, it is, and, he, and with Helen Hunt, um, and I, I got asked that a lot, and I'm like, no, they want the same thing as you. It's not that complicated. And when you have uh, people from diverse backgrounds in these seats, what it says is there's no proverbial glass ceiling. That means there's, there's no barrier to me achieving the greatest levels of success. So guess what? I don't have to spend any mind share worrying on whether or not that I can get to the top of this organization. It suggests to me that I can do my job and make it to the top. So thank you. <laughs> going to the center for the consultant oh. perspective. Uh, so I'll maybe just share a little bit about our kind of manager research perspective, and it's really not very dissimilar from the comments Katie just made, but I would say that our manager research spends a disproportionate amount of time with managers and engaging with managers. So we've done extensive research on this topic and directly how does it relate to performance and outcomes. So our research has indicated that diverse teams, which we'll talk about what that means, right, has led to 45 basis points of outperformance per annum for in upper quartile universes. Even in bottom quartile, diverse teams can still add 14 basis points per annum. You think about that compounded over a very long time horizon for your average DC participant, that is pretty, pretty powerful. So, Philosophically, that is embedded in everything that we do as an organization and the way that we think and approach our investment solutions and driving towards investment outcomes. Now, when we think about diversity within asset management firms, we don't simply think about how much ownership there is, right? That's not really kind of getting to the decision-making element and what's driving those results. So we really do look across leadership. How, what is, what are the, what's the culture of the firm? Who are the individuals that are the culture carriers of the firm? How are they putting in places policies to promote the differentiation around um, diverse thinking and so forth? And then obviously we look at the investment team itself, so not just the portfolio managers, but the supporting analysts and so forth. So that's embedded in what we do. And we've actually, I think, been told by the SEC that we're one of the most nuanced consultants in the industry to take an approach around diversity. So it's, it's inherently a very critical part of our process and really important. I would say the other kind of aspect of what we do, which is really interesting from a global research perspective, is that we get the opportunity to engage with all different types of managers across the world. So not only in Europe, not only in Asia Pac, not only in the US, right? But we get the, the benefit of learning from firms in terms of what's working or what's not working in terms of them moving the needle around again. 
integrating diverse perspectives into their investment teams, which for us is really, really powerful. It allows us to affect change in terms of providing advice to firms that we might be in the process of underwriting and might be falling short in some areas. We can provide some consulting in that regard. And then we also get to somehow, we get to kind of, I don't want to call it steal those practices, but we get to leverage those practices and learnings for our own business and our own capabilities. And just one example of that is very simple, but one of the things that we've started to leverage here within North America and within the US specifically is just building out a diverse Rolodex of talent. So building out that pipeline in advance, and it's exactly, Katie, what you said around the power of network, right? So really leveraging our colleagues, the, you know, the individuals our colleagues know, leveraging those um, industry colleagues, the kind of the interactions with the firms that we have, and really developing that Rolodex in advance so that we have a pretty robust pipeline when we do need to go to market or when we are looking to add to our bench. And that, I think, is really critical because we all know that as soon as you're trying to hire or if you're looking to really have an expanded pool of diverse talent to source from, if you just start at the point of time of the hire, when you decide that that is what is needed, it's very, very difficult to achieve. So I think that's just one of the kind of learnings we've integrated into our ongoing practices. I'm gonna try to update without repeating everything that's been said. Um, but do you wanna echo, I do agree 100% that the cognitive diversity is the biggest benefit. Um, and that's something as a manager of a team, that's something that I've worked really hard to build here in our Atlanta team. Um, so Callum has been pretty supportive. Katie was saying she met our executive chairman the other day. He has been a very strong proponent of promoting women long before I got to Callum. Um, so he really started with that leadership at the top and providing opportunities, recognizing contributions, bringing women into this sweet C-suite years ago. Um, so I'd say the evolution of that is really taking a step back to say, okay, that's great. We have some women in the leadership position are we still doing enough, right? Are we really giving them the opportunities? Do the younger women see the career path? Um, so that was some of the feedback that we got internally. We did, we had an external consultant come in and, and say, okay, could we be doing more? And that was one of the big things that came back is we're not exactly sure how to get from point A to point B. We don't necessarily have a formal mentorship. Um, so that's something that we've been spending a lot of time working on. We feel like it's important for us to walk the same walk that we expect managers to. Um, and again, I think we're, consultants, one of my colleagues is here, and we were talking about this earlier, we're both white women, we both have similar educational backgrounds, we come at things very differently, and having us together on a team, Emily sees things that I miss, and vice versa, um, and so our clients benefit from that, because the two of us together coming at it differently, we may externally look similar, they call us each other's names, and they view us interchangeably, but we are very different. Um, and so when we work with our clients and looking at managers similarly, we're looking for the same thing. And one of the questions that came up in our prep call was, how do you know the difference? How can you tell if someone's just saying or if they're actually committed to diversity and improving? Um, and I think one of the things we look for is many firms will come in and say, we have a policy, we hire a person, it's going to be great. Um, and you say, okay, well, we hired a person. Um, versus other firms that say, here's our strategy, this is our focus, and here's how we're gonna review and evaluate that over time. I think that's really the key, is do you have a plan in place to say what's working, is, and how can we continue to evolve? If you just throw something together and say it's gonna be fine, that's not really a true commitment, that's just checking the box so that you think you'll get into searches because you can check the box. Um, so that's definitely one of the things that that we look for. And then I'm very, very excited that we have moved beyond just the 51% ownership. Um, I think it's important to really broadly spread the opportunity. 51% ownership could be one person who is female or diverse that has all the economics. It's much more important to be sharing that more broadly, creating more opportunities for a larger and larger number of people, giving them the opportunity to advance in whatever direction they want to and removing all the ceiling so that if you want to be an analyst, if you want to be a portfolio manager, whatever position you want in the firm, you have access to it is really the key as opposed to just a few owners. Yeah. Do you feel like your clients have moved on though from the whole yes. ownership? Or the 50, it's, the majority ownership? I mean, it's hard. The, the ownership is the easiest. Yeah. Like you can log in, you can very clearly verify that. 
Um, and so we spend a lot of time working on how do you quantify, right? So one of our clients sends out a survey to all of their managers each year. So it's not necessarily, I mean, the first year you do that, you're just setting the baseline. And so then each year it gives you the opportunity to say, is there improvement? And to dig deeper and deeper. So looking at a number of different factors from top to bottom of the organization. Um, but it, it's harder, but I think it's more fun. Like that's the exciting part is really digging in there to see, okay, what's happening? What are they doing? Is it working? And then we do the same thing. We bring some of those best practices back into. So um, who was here two years ago in this room? Mostly men, come on. <laughs> four years ago? So four years ago, we met just before we all went home for a really long time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And four years ago, we were all going to the office five days a week. And so there was a work-life balance discussion. But this global pandemic kind of interrupted how we, how we think about things. And now, we're also seeing kind of a rebound as it relates to return to office. And there is some tension there with regard to, to, to discussions and, and comments. But let's first start with kind of how COVID has changed the dynamic affecting uh, work-life balance. And, and specifically, Christy, if I could have you kind of kick things off um, as it relates to, to women and opportunities in this new environment, new dynamic. Um, sure. So my outlook might not be all that positive, maybe perhaps relative to other panelists, but I think um, the, the benefit or silver lining, if there was one, of the pandemic, right, was that you had a lot of folks being able to work from home or you had some type of hybrid type of arrangement. And so I think that provided a lot of opportunity for, especially for females, to have an opportunity to re-enter the workforce or find the um, ability to call it um, work and also have all the other things they need to manage within their, within their um, home life kind of in balance, if that's actually a thing. So I think you saw a lot of females re-enter the workforce as part of that dynamic because they saw more opportunity and ability to manage their careers. They just have more tools or levers to effectively do that. And I think once you kind of overlay what's transpired over the past couple of years with return to office and the mandates back to office, I fully appreciate the benefit of going into the office and the collaboration that's, re that's required and what arises from collaboration and particularly for, call it the transfer of knowledge and the learning and development opportunities are key. But I think it's, right, if you overlay where we have been in terms of this reemergence um, or more entrants coming into the workforce with this kind of friction around return to office, which is maybe perhaps a little bit different than what folks signed up for, and then you're kind of back around the management of all of those different factors. I think we're starting to regress a bit, and I think we're also seeing just in terms of the overall kind of dynamic and um, prioritization around some of these items kind of declining. So it is a little bit, I feel like, as Radha said earlier, right, with the decline and even in the membership here, I think you're, we're starting to see a little bit more pressure in terms of, um, call it opportunities, and really um, firms taking the time to ensure that they do have a really diverse pool in terms of talent considerations as they move forward, and also just their kind of strategic plan around some of these initiatives, um, I think is starting to become a little bit more deprioritized relative to the progress we've seen in the past few years. And then so kind of rolling forward, and Elizabeth, this is going to be for you, as it relates to you know, COVID, oh, I can work from home. Oh, you can work 24 hours a day. <laughs> Have we had this boomerang effect where there's a risk of burnout, and, and respectfully, it's not just affecting female employees, but just employees in general? Well, yes and yes. I mean, it is my <laughs> male colleagues also have concerns about this. Um, it is when the, when the pandemic first hit, it was a, okay, we're home. This is, all right, we can do this. And then everybody else was home and our clients would say, well, you, could, you, know, you can't really say, oh, I'm on vacation, because they know you're in your house. <laughs> and like, it's on Zoom. So even if you are on vacation, well, you can just take your laptop with you and just hop on this call. It's only going to take an hour. Um, so there was a, it became really hard to separate and it became really hard to have boundaries. It's gotten a little bit easier now that 
lots of people are back and you know our clients are taking vacation everyone's taking vacation so at least there's a little bit um but it is there's it's really hard to separate and and get away from it because you're always connected i mean some of that was just having a cell phone before the pandemic uh, but i think it's become even more important to set boundaries um, and then to your point about the burnout, there's <laughs> obviously there's no magic solution because I read a lot about this and if it was easy to solve, somebody would have solved it. Um, but a couple things that I've seen, I don't have the answer, but some of the things that I'm trying are, some of it's a mental game. Um, so just that feeling that you're always on, you're always connected. I should always be, I mean, even right now, like, am I missing an email? Should I be checking? I'm not reachable right now. Um, and that can add stress. So just giving yourself permission to detach from it and saying, I'm gonna take this many hours. And some of it's on us. I think we put a lot of the guilt on ourselves. I don't think other people necessarily expect us to feel as connected as we think they do. Um, so that's one thing is just to try to give yourself permission. Another is to think about, okay, why am I working late? Sometimes I just can't get it done and it bleeds into the night and I have to work on the weekends, but sometimes it's my choice because that is a nice benefit of having more flexibility is sometimes I make a choice to cut out early and go see my nephews play basketball. And so I work late that, I'm not working late because, and I have to remind myself of this too, so I don't get grumpy about like, oh, I'm always working. But no, I, I made a choice to go and prioritize my family first and then log back in later. So there's, there's pros and cons, and I think we just kind of have to keep reminding ourselves that as much as it can be stressful, it's also, there's some positives to it. So I think just, again, I'm sorry, I'm starting to ramble a bit. <laughs> basically just creating boundaries and then also just reminding ourselves, um, just kind of reframing that merging of, of work and life. Yeah. Lara, any advice as it relates to boundaries, guidelines, some self-discipline? Yeah, um, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, it has, to, to your point, I feel like we're still trying to find this new normal and I can say, even as you know, an economist looking at national statistics, one of the things that we follow very closely is public um, transportation ridership during business hours, Monday through Friday. And we're all still trying to find a new normal. You know, cities like Atlanta, like Philadelphia, even Chicago, New York, San Francisco, that ridership isn't back to where it was pre-pandemic, but it's still creeping up. It hasn't plateaued yet. So I always keep that in the back of my mind, like it's not just me that hasn't found a new normal. It's like everybody who hasn't found a new normal yet. Um, and I think to your point, Elizabeth, that you know, I I feel like the pendulum has swung now in so many directions. You know, I remember five years ago when I might actually leave for the night and not bring my computer home, which now just sounds crazy. Um, you know, so I was we were talking with a group of women at work, and we said, you know what, let's maybe do it a couple nights a week, and. I'm lucky enough to live 10 minutes away from my office, so if something you know, I have my phone, if something really happens, I can I can get it. But um, you know, as far as you know, I think you know again having the kids and you know the age that they are, they're also now sort of you know doing their own thing. Sports, everyone's really busy. Um, I have just really purposely put my phone and really like in our house, like phones are away at uh, like a big group charger for a, like an hour is like a really good night if I can get everyone off their phone for an hour <laughs> together. Um, and, and I just think, you know, that has just been so important, like physically put it away from yourself because um, I'm probably the best in my family, but I see my husband and my kids are like, just caught, it's like, they can't even physically put it down. So, uh, so I think that's something that we really, you know, work on as a family. It is a work in progress, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, it, to, at the end of the day, just those little moments of being present, I think a little goes a long way. So we're still trying to figure it out in my house and in my company. And then Katie, I want to shift just a little bit. So from work-life balance to home office balance. Is, you know, so what is TCW thinking as it relates to being in the office, remote work, hybrid work? What, you know, there's probably no one solution, but what is the overall firm's approach to Sure. Challenge. Sure. And I, I have a lot of empathy for this need to, I, I don't love the term work-life balance because it just suggests an impossible equilibrium. That's like another thing we'll feel guilty for not achieving. <laughs> um, so I just think about it as work-life integration. Um, I have four children, so they're ages, and, and they're little, so they're three, five, seven, and nine. Um, and so I need to be obviously very present for them, plus I'm running a company of uh, 600 people, so there's a lot on the plate. 
Um, and I'll answer it from my personal perspective and then TCW. There are some jobs that we need people to be in five days a week. So I'm just gonna be very clear about that. Um, particularly trading and investing, we want that done in the office. And we also work in a business on the investing side that we think is very um, important that it's an apprenticeship culture. And it's really important um, that our young people that are going into investing roles, which frankly, they don't know anything, and that's okay, like we've hired them for that reason, that they can work alongside kind of shoulder to shoulder with women and men that have been doing those jobs for many decades. Um, so that, that is something we're very focused on, and our investors need to be, uh, we would like them to be in the office uh, five days a week. We also work with people individually on flexibility, and we acknowledge that there's other jobs that can lend themselves to much better flexibility, and we'll provide that flexibility for people. Um, and then just a final comment on the idea of how we pull this together. I always think about it in my life and try and give people the advice that Clearly my four children cannot come first every time. It's not possible to do that and run a company. Um, but it's like in investing that we're not gonna get it right every time, but we try and get it right over time. And for me personally, it helps me feel better that if I look back at the quarter, I can say my family really came first here, but not, not every day is that gonna be true. Um, and I do think it is so important to know what matters to you in life. And for me, it doesn't have to be this way for everybody, it could be something else. But for me, my family is the most important thing in my life. And I've been able to make that true while also achieving professional success. And as long as that's the case, I'll continue to do that. But if I feel like it's really getting out of whack, you know, I'll take the job and shove it, frankly, because I really want to put my family first. And so you do have to remind yourself of that. I'm emphasizing it because if you don't hold that really as your north, it's so easy to drift away. And I know there's people in this audience trying to uh, manage that situation. And so I just, my kids, for example, they're great. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But like, they don't listen to me all the time. So at all. Um, at work, I get listened to more. And so and when I, like write an email or I do something for my job, I get an immediate return on that. And that feels really good to me because I'm a high achieving person. With my kids, there's like these high friction moments and they're not listening and doing what I tell them to do. And I don't know if it's gonna work out this time I'm spending with them for like 10 years. It's like the <laughs> ultimate long-term investing game. And so it is the reason you have to anchor yourself in saying this is important because you don't get a, I don't know about you guys, but it's not like my family's like, you've had a great quarter, mom. Like, that doesn't happen. So we just have to think about it over the long term. And like all of you, I would say, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's chaos but it works and I would just encourage people to think it over the long term. And I'm very passionate about this because I don't want anyone to opt out of a career. I think it is possible um, to do both. You have to make sacrifices, but if you judged it over a long enough horizon, I think you, you can have a lot of satisfaction um, on both fronts. And yes, we want our investors in the office most of the time. We of course work to answer a question to give people the flexibility that like I need as well to run my own life. And on the devices thing, this is such a critical point. I'm so glad you brought that up, Laura, because we are in an epidemic of loneliness that's being driven a lot by social media and people's over-engagement on technology and with their phones. Um, and we have the model for our kids being present, which is the ultimate gift to give any human. And uh, I think all of us could be a lot better at that and it would help with the burnout. And so I'd like, I have improvement to make on that. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. Note to self, start giving your kids your end evaluations. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly achieved. Mostly achieved. <laughs> so our, <laughs> not that I've never gotten under on that. Um, so, as it was, so the, the final kind of thematic topic is just career, career progression, and dare I say career advice. So, you know, career advice for uh, younger attendees, but also I'm sure we have plenty of hiring managers uh, in the audience as well. And it has, it's ebbed and flowed uh, from the last several um, panels that we hosted, where two years ago we had very much an uplift and a true solid momentum on wanting to fully embrace diversity been slightly interrupted, not maybe not everywhere, uh, but some some hiccups have occurred along the way. 
And so in the, in the current environment, what advice would you have to you know, our emerging talents, um, and for that matter, hiring managers where it's trying to identify emerging talent? How do you navigate this type? How do you, how do you make that career step and promote yourself? Oh, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know if I, <laughs> I didn't know what was up. Um, you know, so um, I think something that I have found, and I've, I've talked to a lot of uh, young women in, in my career over a long period of time, and something that I have often found is that, um, you know, women who are younger in their career can, through, I think, well-intentioned um, attempts to plan their career, can almost throw up roadblocks for themselves before they've even happened. I have watched really smart young women talk themselves out of going for a job because, you know, in, in like years in the future, or putting themselves on track for a job because they all of a sudden think, well, that could be really tough to have a baby and how would I navigate that and how would I take maternity leave, you know, like five years from now if the guy that I'm dating maybe proposes to me and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, you know, like, like go, you know, go for it. Um, you, you know, I think there's never a, per first of all, there's never a perfect time to have a baby, start a family, that's like, you know. So I always, I get a lot of advice on that. I get a, that, ask that a lot. You know, I had my kids later, but I didn't move on until later. So, you know, um, but I think, you know, I think that, that may be just, uh, you know, maybe there's a biological component. I think women, you know, don't want to generalize, but maybe more planners. Um, so my advice is like, go for it. You know, and to some degree, if you've got a great career, you're passionate about your job, you really like it, that is a, going to be a much better motivator for you to stick with it after you maybe start a family or maybe marry someone who, you know, you want to move to a different place or, or even just do something, you know, very different with your career. I don't need to make it all family based, you know, in terms of, of career motivation. Um, so, you know, my advice is always to go for it. I just wanted to also say one last thing about, about this guilt aspect because I do travel a lot for work and, you know, I found myself, you know, getting this wonderful speaking opportunity at a big conference on the same night that my daughter, you know, had her sixth grade graduation and was leaving the school and they had this, you know, big ceremony and I had to miss it. And, you know, I wanted to do both things. I really try to reframe, you know, when people talk about guilt is just saying that a lot of times I just wish I could be in two places at once and I can't. And so, you know, I was with a, a lot of other, I'm lucky to work with several other working moms who are really incredible. I admire them every day. And uh, we all got together, we made a little video, you know, ha congratulations, Helen, we're all thinking of you down here in Florida for your, you know, sixth grade graduation. We sent it to her. She knew we were thinking about her and that she was on my mind. So uh, you just, unfortunately, that's life. You can't be everywhere at once. I, I know there are lots of dads who also travel too and miss important stuff. So, um, but I think that to me for career advice is just so critical. Go for it. If you're passionate about your work and you're passionate about doing other things outside of work, I feel like you can make it all work together. Um, I'll probably maybe give three different, three tips. I think the first one that I always talk about, and I, this is a little bit of a soapbox, which I'll spare all of you on my soapbox, but I think that one of the most important things that you can do for your career um, is to ensure you have the appropriate sponsor and advocacy within your network. Ideally, your sponsor or advocate should be within the firm you reside in and can really help you navigate some of those dynamics and challenges and are always going to be speaking on your behalf when you are not in the room. So I think that would be fundamentally, as you think about, we talk a lot about mentorship and so forth and having the right mentor, but I think a lot of the time we need to make sure we're emphasizing having the right type of sponsorship and advocacy specifically for you and your career growth. And that's really going to help catalyze opportunities. And I think if you have the right advocacy, you're also going to get a lot of exposure to potential stretch assignments. Um, and I think that's probably a little bit more important on the margin for women um, to really kind of push them into areas they may not otherwise consider. Um, I think the second item I would probably raise would be around, um, I think there's a little bit of a difference in terms of evaluation of new roles or jobs and opportunities, where I think there's been a bit of research done on it, and I don't have the exact statistics, where I think the majority of men, if they read a job description, you know, they might qualify for 40% of the requirements, and they're kind of going for it. Like, I 
you know, 40% there, I got most of it, I'm going to apply for the job, I got this covered, right? Where women, I think, take, you know, oh, I met nine out of the 10 requirements, I'm not a good fit for this, I'm probably not going to be, you know, looked at in the same way or really considered or evaluated for this position. And I think that is, that we should try and kind of um, actively realize or have awareness around that. And I think for females as they're considering new jobs, it does, you don't have to meet all the criteria. If you think it's a really interesting opportunity, you have the right skills, and maybe not all of those skills are on the paper um, or listed in that job criteria, you should not, not explore that opportunity and take the time to really engage on what that role could mean for your career and your next steps. Um, so a lot of the, I think, you know, from a hiring manager perspective, there's a lot of work that we do, and I think other firms have done in terms of trying to call it equalize some of the job, descript job descriptions to try to take out some of those inherent issues with postings. Um, the third thing I would say is just, from my perspective, I think as you grow in your career, the one thing that I found over time, and specifically for me personally, is if someone approaches me with opportunities that I've done or align with things I know I can do well, so, hey, Christy, can you help us with X, Y, Z, you know, on this particular project, um, so forth and so on, you, you have sufficient experience, you know, you need your expertise, I normally say no. <laughs> I normally say no because I've done it, I know I can do it, I have that experience, and so I'm really most keenly, like, again, from a self-awareness perspective, I want to push myself into areas that I haven't done before, and I don't really know if I'm going to excel at them, and those are the only things that I really want to spend my time on to really kind of explore, and if I fail, that's a good outcome, because I learned that I probably should not do that <laughs> if I want to go for the basics, but I think for me, it's the pushing and the learning as you go, and just, again, the self-recognition, right? Like, you don't have to be in a familiar place. It's actually really good to be in a very uncomfortable place because that's where you kind of learn the most about what you want to do and again your overall skill set. Um, that's a really good take on saying no. I feel like it's important to say no but I've never thought about it from that angle which I think is really insightful. Um, in addition to those all kind of I guess three other pieces of advice I think first figuring out what it is you enjoy I think you're a lot more likely to be successful if you do something that you enjoy versus just saying like, oh, I hear that's a good job. I hear that pays well. You might do okay, but are you really going to excel at that if you don't have that, somebody mentioned passion. Like, I think that's where the passion comes from. And if you're really committed to it, you really enjoy it, I think you're more likely to dig in deeper and do really well. Um, I mentioned, like, I started in, I'm not a good stock picker. I don't love it. I don't like it. I'm not really good at direct sales, but consulting, I love big picture strategy. Like, what's the problem? How can I figure out, how can I identify it? What can we do about it? And I really like that big picture being part of the whole thing. And I think that's part of why I've done well here. Um, not that I was terrible at the other ones I did, but, um, <laughs> but I think that's, that's part of that success of so figuring out what it is you like. I advise a lot of our analysts, you're never gonna spend all day doing 100% of what you like. There's always tedious stuff, but try to get 70 to 80% of your day on things that you enjoy, that you find rewarding, that you're learning, however you define that. Um, second, be really good at it. And that's stating the obvious, but I think it's important to state, you're not gonna get ahead just by showing up. You have to really commit, you have to do the work. Um, you see, and I won't get into the generational differences, but, but sometimes people just like, but I'm here. Right? I'm here, I should get promoted. No, you need to work really hard and demonstrate that you've earned the, like you have to earn a promotion. Um, you have to work hard. Again, I just could hear you it say seems this. obvious, but I'm a great boss. So again, I just, it's, it's important, like you gotta work at it, you gotta master it. You have to master the position you have before you can go after the next position. Um, and then similarly, advocate for yourself, find someone else to advocate for you. I think both are important. Um, but again, you have to master that to be able to advocate. You have to have something to go in there and say, here's why. Here's what I've done that the positions mean not just to do the same thing, but like I did this and I mastered this, therefore I can move up to this next thing and I can tackle that too. Um, so giving something, you have to give your advocate something to work with um, and not be afraid to 
what is this? We have our office says two your own two. Um, but but I think that's something that we're not to over stereotype. But I think women are not great at standing up for ourselves and saying I did a good job. Can we top that? Oh yeah. <laughs> I just on the advice point. One thing I wanted to say is I made the comment before. I'll just make a parallel comment, kind of knowing where you want to go in life. And for me, I said making my family the center of it. I think you do that. It's important to do that professionally too. Um, and I think it will help us bring people through a mid-career phase. Like, do you have an end goal of where you want to go so you can organize your time and talent around it? Um, and I, I did actually realize at one point that I wanted to have the privilege to lead an asset management company. And so I was very deliberate about seeking out the job opportunities that would lead me towards that goal. I think it's a very important to visualize where it is that you want to go. And then that will help you consciously and unconsciously. You'll move towards that because you'll really seek out the opportunities that will make you qualified to do that. And then you don't have to have all nine out of 10. You just have to have enough. Uh, believe in yourself. And by the way, get the right team around you. Uh, which women are excellent at doing, and, and you will get there. I will end by saying um, I actually said publicly on panels like this that I wanted to be the CEO of an asset management company, apparently, um, because I, first of all, the headhunter heard me say that, that helped call me for this job. But when it was announced that I was going to be the CEO of TCW, I had so many people call me and be like, you always said you wanted to be the CEO. I was like, jeez, I said that a lot publicly. But it, it really made me think, like, in most things in life, if you put it out into the universe, you, it will pull you there. You can manifest it and organize your time and talent towards those big goals. And then the second very practical piece of advice I wanted to make sure I said, it's not like a magical unicorn that, like, I have four kids and I run a company. I have a lot of help. And I want to be always open and honest about that because it's actually not possible for me to do this on my own. So I have a husband who contributes more than I do uh, to household work, who's an incredible partner um, and happens to be a veteran, went to multiple wars. So he really has the better demeanor for dealing with his children sometimes <laughs> than I do. Um, he runs a small business as well, but he's much more engaged in the family. I have two full-time nannies that help us out who are kind of part of our family. Um, and my mom, who is in New York, was a hard part of moving to LA, but she flies back and forth all the time. My sister helps out. So I have an enormous network of people to rely on and an awesome team at work. And it wouldn't be possible without that. And I always just want to say that to people because I don't want people to think just magically I'd be able to do it. I'm just playing a small role, actually, in the broader orchestra of all the people that make it possible. Awesome. So we're, we're hitting the lightning round, ladies. Okay. Uh, so we're going to pivot to some market questions. <laughs> sure, yeah. we got some investor, a couple of investors, two or three in the room, maybe. Uh, Laura, I want you to set the table. Yeah. When's the Fed going to cut interest rates? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the, good, <laughs> the, good, the good news is, um, you know, I think this year, last year, we were this time last year, there was just such pervasive concern about the economy and the potential for a recession. Um, you know, several alarm bells, and I include myself as one of the people who was very nervous about that, things like the inverted yield curve, we had the regional bank crisis, you know, several regional bank failures, um, you know, the most aggressive rate hike cycle since the 1980s. These were things that really, I think had a lot of us, you know, feel like a very high probability of a recession was out there. And I think the good news is that as we sort of acclimated to this higher interest rate environment, um, that has um, receded. The economy has a lot of tailwind. I like to remind people the economy wants to grow. It naturally grows. Something really has to, you know, happen to knock it off of that path. Um, and the longer that we're here, sort of living with these higher rates, I like to say it's like moving from Arizona to you know winter in Chicago. Like the first winter's horrible, and then the next winter you sort of like okay, you, know, you kind of get used to it now. Like the longer we're here with these higher interest rates, I think we will um, acclimate. But um, happily, there's been a lot of progress on inflation. Um, I think the Fed you know clearly wants to cut rates this year. I just remind everybody, and I say this with love in my heart for the place where I used to work, um, you know, they don't always get to do what they want. They are not great forecasters of themselves. And, um, and so, and so um, you know, I think it's going to, I, you know, I use the phrase very purposely, surgical rate cuts uh, in the second half of the year, 
I've penciled in two to three, but I think we need to remember that really we need markets, data to all align to uh, to get that that to happen, so that kick off to happen. Penciled in, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Christy, um, obviously there is a discrepancy as it relates to rates and market expectations. Well, you know, how does this affect kind of the, the backdrop for risk taking, and what are the potential consequences that investors should be thinking about? Sure. So I think, as we've already discussed a little bit around expectations for rates, I think the um, even if a soft landing is perhaps maybe now the median case on Wall Street, I'm not entirely sure where all the bets align. I think there's still a pretty high risk for policy error, and so that will then potentially lead to upper volatility. So I'm not entirely sure we've actually ever effectively navigated a soft landing. No. <laughs> <laughs> Once. Um, so I think the macro volatility obviously creates opportunities within portfolios, right, as you can really try and harvest or access diversifying sources of alpha. Um, and if you think about that in contrast that where our typical investors are, right, return kernels have increased over the past few years. Many investors in portfolios still need to make money in their portfolios, so that return need is still fairly high. Um, and obviously, equities have been fairly directional the past year or two, but it's really important to think about diversifying those bets. And again, that macro volatility backdrop, how can you expand your opportunity set within your portfolio to really protect against all of these potential outcomes while still earning the returns required? So we're seeing a lot of our investors and really what we're advocating for in a number of our portfolios is really expanding those opportunity sets. So diversified credit is a, is a pretty standard lever in our portfolios. Um, so potentially moving more into private debt within diversified credit, obviously looking at liquid alternatives, specifically hedge funds within liquid alts, and then within real assets, really looking for some more niche opportunities outside again of your backdrop around commercial real estate, which is not what favorable. <laughs> so I'm gonna, so Katie, I'm gonna jump over to you um, <laughs> as it relates to what is keeping you and broadly your investors up at night? So what is it that you guys are collectively worried about? Poor kids. Uh, yes, at work. <laughs> um, so I would, I, I'm all well articulated and um, it's kind of the number one thing is that risk at our clients need to be generating return. And at the same time, a lot of risk assets are actually quite expensive. Um, so. I personally think that the world moves in cycles and we will eventually get a recession. I don't know when it's gonna be, but that will come. I am worried about a credit event. I mean, you talked about commercial real estate. The words being used to describe that are contained. We had another real estate issue that was very contained 15 years ago. It turned out not to be. There was more leverage. It was a less sophisticated borrower, but these things can become systemic if they show up in the banking system. So I would say that's something that keeps us up at night. I think there'll be an epic opportunity on the other side of it, selectively in commercial real estate, but it could be the source of something systemic. On the other hand, when we're all talking about something, it's usually not the thing, but that did kind of happen with residential, so I'm open to that, and that makes us worried. Uh, but the big worry is credit spreads have only been this tight 2% of the time since the global financial crisis. Equity valuations are at record highs, and as I just illustrated, I think there are some potential challenges um, out there. And so I do think you're getting paid to be patient with yields where they are. And so I am, um, I believe in some conservative positioning here and where you can get into exactly what was mentioned in diversifying risk assets. In the private credit space, I would also put forward uh, asset-backed finance where you can do lending backed by cash flows that is not very correlated to corporate credit and is extremely high quality and you can pick up some additional yield uh, versus IG. This idea of hedge funds, they've been very unpopular for a long time. I mean, they're like, hate, no one wants to talk about them, they're awful, it's usually a time to look at something. And if you can now, they have less ego because it's been so bad for a decade, so I'm sure you can get better fees from them. Uh, no? Oh, okay. Um, so maybe not. I don't know. Talk to you please. It's still too hot. Okay. But if you can get them at the right price, that type of absolute return asset, just looking for uncorrelated assets that are still generating returns and staying a little bit conservatively positioned or being paid to be patient, and then wait, and there'll be a lot of money to be made. 
And then Elizabeth, what's the most common question yeah. that you're having to answer for your clients these days? Market, market really. Uh, rates, it's probably number one. What's gonna happen to rates? What do we do? And what are your time? <laughs> Sometimes they're asset managers. Um, <laughs> I'm a consultant, so we say it depends. That's a, it's a classic answer. It depends. Um, uh, what was the question? Oh, what questions are we doing? Um, so definitely rates. How to? And then I think just now, now getting volatility overall. Um, so for so long, equities just went up. Fixed income was just kind of there, and now everything's all over the place. So I think there's a lot of revisiting asset allocation. Do we have the right mix? Should we be, everyone wants to, you know, should we be a little more tactical? Um, which is, anytime people start asking that, it's generally the wrong time uh, to start trying to make that play. Uh, <laughs> but just trying, part of our job as consultants is trying to keep people a little bit steadier and let their asset managers take a little bit more direction um, as opposed to, a board that meets quarterly, trying to jump in and out of things. Um, so yeah, so anyway, so it's rates, what's gonna happen? It, it's always, the biggest questions we get is what's gonna happen and what's everyone else doing? They always wanna know what their peers are doing and how everybody else is allocating it. Um, and I do wanna just say real quickly about hedge funds. When I started my career, hedge funds were amazing. They were gonna solve everybody's problems. It was the best investment. We just have to get the right hedge fund. We'll pay two and 20, no problem. I mean, everybody just wanted hedge funds and now it just, which is interesting. Yeah, they go in, it goes in cycles, and they were obviously not for us. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, we don't have any hedge fund managers out there. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if we do, your fees are still too high. <laughs> <laughs> They're behind the bar right now. <laughs> so I do want to be respectful of time this evening. One question from the audience before we uh, before we wrap. Come on, we were told to be assertive. <laughs> no, a gentleman cannot answer the ask the question. <laughs> I have a question. There we go. Um, I think this is not really a question, but it's more related to the topic of the earlier question. I have a lot of emotions on this topic. No, it's very, they are coming here to get training and they want the senior people to be in the office. And we just know that for internships, for example, for us to get those people to come back full time, it is highly correlated to the fact that they have a manager that has not every day, but majority in office presence because they are coming for an apprenticeship experience. They are coming to learn and they need to have people to learn from. And so the junior people definitely want to have engagement with more senior people. And it depends on what the actual job is, but for investing, when you're picking stocks or picking bonds or putting together portfolios, you're working in markets that are trading 24 hours a day, it does require an office presence and the junior people do need to see that. Um, and also, I think having some personal connectivity is important for culture, which is at the foundation of every company. I'm not sure how you actually build that without having some, some people connectivity. So I think it's, I think it's critical. Um, and then of course, like they wanna have some flexibility like everyone else and we, technology does provide that. So it's about getting that balance right. But we can't recruit the best talent unless they're working for managers that are showing up for them. Thank you. All of you having yet again an amazing panel and I would ask the audience to join me in a uh, heart. Yeah,